Okay. All right. So um, it's useful to uh, uh, first consider the big picture of uh, how does scientific capability relate to um, uh, instrument access. And so this figure is useful for that purpose. Uh, the horizontal axis on a very logarithmic scale is the capability or quality of your instrument, ranging from introductory to world class. The vertical axis, unfortunately, is also on a very logarithmic scale, and it has to do with access frequency. That is, how often can you yourself get access to an instrument of various quality? So it's useful to it's useful to uh, uh, first get used to this kind of figure by thinking about personal transportation. And so your very introductory personal transportation might be a uh, Hello Kitty flip-flops. And of course, those are very easy to acquire. Uh, next, you might have a, a, a toy tricycle or a starter car, a faculty car. Uh, Beamline scientist personal transport is very advanced. And the only step up from that is Elon Musk's personal transport. And the key point here is there's an inverse relationship between how often people can expect to have access to um, uh, uh, some kind of product or instrument and the quality of the, uh, uh, of the product or the instrument. All right, this is, this is very general. And so if we think about uh, a great many different techniques in analytical chemistry and basic research, such as X-ray fluorescence, X-ray diffraction, NMR, and so on, you get this same sort of inverse relationship. Where introductory equipment, it's very easy to get access, and world-class instrument, it's very hard to get access. Um, an exception to this, though, comes from XAS, both XS and XES. In this case, the, uh, the present relationship between instrument capability and access is, is, is strange. Um, there's the synchrotrons and the free electron lasers, and then much less uh, access at lower capability. So as of, uh, well, let's say this month, there's roughly 200 synchrotron beamlines that at least sometimes support XAS, and there's 20 or maybe 25 now um, modern heart X-ray ZAFs or XCS systems, and a few dozen HHGs, higher, high harmonic generation or laser plasma systems for soft X-ray or XUV. And you know this is this is this is very strange. If we think about X-ray diffraction, um, there are there are thousands on thousands of X-ray diffractometers that play a very important role in complementing synchrotron X-ray diffraction capability. But um, so far, that's not the case for, uh, for XFs and XES. So this observation um, led us to the hypothesis that the overwhelming majority of all potential XFs and XCFs applications can happen in the lab. And in particular, most of these don't fit the synchrotron access model. And this includes education, routine analytical chemistry, either for materials research or environmental use, industrial quality control and regulatory compliance, right? These are things, these aren't why the synchrotron is, the synchrotrons are there. Um, and yet each of these could have um, a, a very high uh, demand, very high use request, um, if there was technology to fill this introductory and general purpose niche. So my group, of course, is not alone at all in this view. Um, uh, the group at uh, Technical University Berlin, I'll show um, one of their spectrometers later, um, uh, has been doing wonderful work in both tender and hard x-ray. Uh, the group in Helsinki and the collaboration with Helsinki and Utrecht have been doing great work with their lab-based instrument. Um, the collaboration between Budapest and Krakow uh, with the von Hamo spectrometer, I'll mention some of their work later, uh, has been doing uh, uh, really terrific things with that geometry with the transition edge sensor arrays, NIST, and uh, earlier collaboration with NIST and Uppsala. Um, we're looking both at uh, routine XAS in the lab and also time-resolved XAS. Uh, the uh, soft X-ray system in Warsaw is very impressive. Of course, the people commercializing this uh, would believe this also, and I'm sure there's others I haven't mentioned, and I apologize if I left you off this list. Today, mainly, I'm going to talk about trying to bridge this, this gap 
that is for general purpose capability, um, how do you how do you do that? And what really are the outcomes? And in particular, what's the relationship between an increase in general purpose capability and the operation of the synchrotrons? Um, and, and this leads to um, the idea that, you know, what if by the end of 2023 or 2024, there are 200 lab XFs and XCS systems out there for hard X-rays or in general over all energy ranges? And, you know, it raises very interesting questions. What are they going to be used for? What will be the social benefit? And what will be the relationship to synchrotrons? Something else my group is working on, but I won't tell you about today, is... Um, uh, lower capability, even less expensive technology um, uh, to try and handle introductory label capability for teaching. All right, so as regards these three things, I just want to say the talk intentionally isn't focused on the methods and especially not comparing and contrasting the different ways of doing lab XFs. There are several different proven, really modern lab XFs methodologies using different geometries and detectors and optics. And all of these work because usually at least two and sometimes all three of the sources, optics and detectors being used didn't exist in the 1970s, which was sort of the, the last era when there was a lot of work into the 80s on a lab-based technology. Um, they all work and have various different benefits for different applications, but I really wanna talk about how LabXCS, um, XAS can help resolve the broken access model rather than talking about the technology. So now I have my title slide. Um, of course, I'm at University of Washington. As disclaimer, um, I do have an involvement with EZZAFs, but I won't be talking about uh, their instruments or products. Um, we've had a, a number of, of great collaborators and collaborations through the years. Um, uh, uh, really, especially uh, to bring out uh, Devin Mortensen and Evan and Will, uh, Stash Kozamore, uh, the COSART group at University of Washington, and um, uh, the uh, John Cyber and, uh, and Jamie Weaver and this, just as a few people to really bring out for special attention. And we've been fortunate to have funding from a number of different sources. All right, so the outline of my talk, first I'll focus on ZAFs and um, address the question of uh, what beam characteristics are needed for really either ZAFs or XES for favorable samples. And then I'll show a number of examples for hard X-ray uh, XAFs uh, before I move to XES, where I'll start with hard X-rays and then move to tender X-rays and then I'll conclude. Okay, so the first question should be how much flux do you need to do a measurement of XFs? And, and the answer is really um, uh, not much if the samples are very concentrated. So this is a simulation for FE203 with an edge step of one. And um, uh, you can see the label here, 10 to the three points. This is a simulated spectrum, uh, pardon me, per point. This is a simulated spectrum when there's only um, 1,000 incident X-rays at each energy step or 10,000 photons at each energy step and so on. And the data gets good very quickly. Right at 10 to the 5, I might wish I had a little bit more averaging out in the pre-edge, but I'm not losing a lot of information otherwise. So this leads to the idea that introductory in the sense of that figure that I started to talk with might mean 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 photons per second in one EV band. So you'd get a, a good spectrum in a few hours to a day, depending on sample details. And general purpose would be more like 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6. And then you get a good spectrum in a few minutes to, um, uh, to maybe a day if there was a lot of background absorption. You know, compared to synchrotron, of course, you have 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 13 photons per second in a 1 EV band. Um, that being said, uh, you know, the brilliance is absolutely necessary for dilute systems to be able to do fluorescence yield, uh, time-resolved studies, nanoimaging, uh, and, and many other reasons we love to go to the synchrotron to do our XFs but it's not needed for routine studies of concentrated samples. For XES, the, the situation is, is strangely much more favorable. This surprised us. You have your synchrotron with a beam hitting a sample to a spectrometer and you get a spectrum. And in the lab, you have a tube with a broad spectrum. Here it might be monochromatic. Here you have a spectrally broad source, but all the photons above the binding energy of the element you care about can be making fluorescence. 
and you have fluorescence and it goes to a spectrometer and you get a spectrum. Well, at least in, in, in a great many cases, the spectrometers being used in the lab are very similar, if not basically the same spectrometers used at the synchrotron. And so if you can get a flux of 10, say 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, um, on your sample in the lab, then uh, you ought to be getting similar count rates and similar performance. And in fact, that's exactly what you can do with a 50 or 100 watt uh, X-ray tube that's been around for a long time for X-ray fluorescence measurements. So the bottom line here is XES in the lab is much easier than ZAFs and should allow um, a lot of measurement of weak lines or dilute systems. And I have a, a, a short LinkedIn article about that point for anyone who's curious. You know, we, we sort of expected um, for non-resonant XES that, okay, you know, with our first instrument, we'd be able to play around a little bit. And, but we quickly realized that, you know, it's, we had something more like this, uh, a jet powered bicycle with even the very first instrument. And, um, and that's really been fascinating to us. All right, so we had uh, uh, these, these back of the envelope calculations that suggested we'd be able to do lab XAFs and XES. And we had to decide how to make the instrument. And um, we thought it's important to keep it very simple. And um, uh, we, we wanted to be able to just buy parts and use our hex key, uh, very little machining and put something together as quickly as we could to test these ideas. So that led to the spectrometer known as the coffin in our lab. And, um, uh, you know, it was a, a wooden box with a lead staple dented. It looked like an old West coffin from a, a cowboy movie. And our first, uh, our first helium space was a garbage bag. And the happy graduate student who can measure XAFs and XES every day is Devin Mortensen, who went on to found Easy Zaps. So we started the instrument up uh, in mid-October 2013. If you look inside, it's very much a prototype. Um, this is a 10-watt x-ray tube. Um, it's sometimes used uh, uh, with battery power to go to farms so that veterinarians on the farm can take x-rays of animals there. Um, uh, so that's our broadband x-ray source. Uh, here's our monochromatizing element is a spherically bent crystal analyzer we borrowed from a friend at a synchrotron. It's on a homemade two-axis tilt. And then we go to a small silicon drift detector and um, uh, scan these two motors and the third motor uh, to make a Roland circle spectrometer. So we had many papers uh, with this simple instrument, even with the rubber bands and uh, dental mirrors and, and all the, the little pieces in there. And um, this was uh, one of our very first pieces of data. And this is lithium cobalt oxide. And, you know, this is a very good optic we're using. So as long as the source isn't too big, we should have very good energy resolution. And indeed, that's the case. Um, this was uh, the very first iteration, uh, maybe 3,000 photons per second. The data probably took about six hours. And we had to turn the tube down to three watts because of saturation from a harmonic but it was still a very promising start. We've gone through, I don't know, three or four or five more generations of instrument development. And of course, now you can frequently get as much as uh, a 10 to the six or very close to 10 to the six per second monochromatic flux with this Roland circle geometry. Um, XES did indeed turn out to be really uh, pretty easy in the lab. And so here is some valence decor data with, I think this was just a 50 watt tube. And um, of course, this is, uh, uh, this is really the weakest X-ray emission that you would want to study. So uh, indeed, lab-based XES is very powerful. So the, the kind of bottom line in the introduction here is that by late 2013, we knew we could easily perform transmission mode zanes and even ex soon extended XFs on concentrated samples. And we could do an awful lot of XES in the lab. Of course, very much at the same time and maybe even a bit earlier, uh, the group at TU Berlin had similar conclusions with different technology, and, and there are different groups out there already working on VUX, very soft neck saps with laser plasma sources and so on. So the rest of the talk, I'm going to summarize the applications of Lab XAS, and in particular, those that really don't fit the synchrotron use model. Um, that said, I'll pause here for questions. Hey, thanks, Jerry. That's a great start. Uh, any questions? So 
uh, Neil, do you want to ask your question or would you like me to uh, uh, paraphrase it? Thanks, Matt. Th thanks, Jerry, for a um, uh, really interesting introduction. So back to the lithium cobaltate data, and I think you, measured, you mentioned the importance of the beam size uh, in relation to resolution, which I think is something to do with the illumination of the analyzer and the size of the refocus beam relative to the area of the detector when it's refocused. Is, is that correct? Could you? Could um, you not, not quite. Um, mm -hmm. What matters is the source size. So if the spot on the, um, on the anode of the X-ray tube becomes too big, then the analyzer sees a range of incident angles on it. And then Bragg's law tells you you'll get energy smearing. Understood. Thank you. And so now for a one meter rolling circle, you try to keep the source, uh, let's say, at a millimeter or smaller. And for the half meter, um, uh, ideally more like a half millimeter source or smaller. Uh, okay. For energies. And so then the takeoff angle is also important. Is that right? Because it, it, it controls the, the, the source size. The takeoff angle from the um, analyzer, you mean? From the tube. Oh, um, y y yes, there's a lot of things internal to the tube that matter. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I'm just going to paraphrase. Young Ha asks if you can comment on some safety issues for the radiation controls. Um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Our first system, um, we hadn't learned very much about that. And um, our x-ray tube could go up to 60 kilovolts, so we had a millimeter of lead everywhere. Um, later, as we thought about it, we realized we never really needed the tube to go above about 30 kilovolts accelerating potential. And so as we moved forward, we had the high voltage generators constrained to 30 kilovolts. And that then let us use, um, what is it, 11 gauge steel. I can't remember what that is in real units. Um, but um, uh, it's really not too hard to, uh, uh, to make a steel radiation enclosure that'll stop 30 kilovolt photons. So it's turned out to be not too bad. In our case, um, we have a large medical school at University of Washington. And so we have, there's a professional staff for radiation safety who comes over and inspects all of our systems. And, and then Matt Carpenter, did you have a, why don't you ask your question? Because it might, go ahead. Matt Carpenter asks if you can comment on the setup for the zinc. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I just couldn't get it to unmute. No, it's okay. Yes, uh, so on one of your slides, you showed zinc valence decor x ray emission spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, was that taken on a different instrument than your, or I assume that was taken on a different instrument than your uh, uh, coffin setup? No, actually, I apologize. I didn't, I didn't really go into the details much here. So um, this is a monochromator, and whatever x rays go to this analyzer, uh, as we scan these motors, we'll get a scan spectrum. So if you pick up the x-ray tube and rotate it 90 degrees and put your sample um, where I'm trying to show with uh, the cursor right now, um, then the fluorescence from the sample will go to the analyzer and you'll build up a spectrum by scanning the instrument. So yeah, you can use this, uh, uh, this same kind of spectrometer for either the XS or the XCS. Thank you. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, why don't we continue and uh, think about it, more stuff later. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, uh, you know, you want to really know that your monochromator works. Uh, this is some extended XFs um, uh, taken on with this vanadium foil, I believe. And you can see the agreement with synchrotron is very good and the measurement time is not bad despite an old detector and old optics and so on. Excuse me. Um, we've done a lot of measurements on battery electrode materials. So um, this is a, a sample from uh, Lewis Piper's group at um, uh, SUNY Binghamton. It's in uh, Evan Jarman's RSI paper. And, um, you know, the agreement with synchrotron, again, is very good. The measurement was fast. But the key point here is battery electrode laminates are about as ideal a transmission mode XF sample as you're going to find. Their edge step is generally pretty close to one for the dominant metal species. And um, uh, they're engineered to be very spatially uniform so that uh, pinholes are usually are 
seldom going to be a problem. And so right away, this suggests um, some future directions that um, maybe are not a great fit with the synchrotron, uh, such as industrial quality control to monitor the synthesis, the actual manufacturing, and even for post-mortem analysis when, uh, when batteries fail. Um, we've done some operando studies on a pouch cell battery, so if you crack open your cell phone far enough, you'd eventually find a battery that looks like this. And this, for example, is the nickel K edge. We wanted to see how the nickel oxidation state changed with charging. And um, uh, in fact, we were able to take that edge uh, about every three minutes, and we were able to see how the position of the edge uh, changed under um, uh, cycling conditions of different speeds. These are different uh, charging rates. Um, three minutes, again, sorry, old optics and slow detector at UW. Um, but, um, <coughs> excuse me, this was, uh, uh, we think, really interesting for showing the kind of work you can do in the lab, such as for very long baseline studies to understand battery fatigue or fading, as it's called in the community. Um, there's been uh, other operando work already with lab-based XAS. Uh, so the Lutz and Fitchin work is really interesting. They looked at vanadium redox flow batteries um, over very long timelines and also some very nice work on catalysts by um, the Helsinki-Utrecht uh, um, collaboration, uh, uh, Moya uh, Cansino et al. and ChemCat Chem uh, two years ago. Um, another really analytical application here, our collaborators in chemistry were making cobalt phosphide nanophases, and they were having trouble um, convincing themselves whether they were making cobalt phosphide or cobalt 2 phosphide. Um, but it was straightforward to run the appropriate references, and you can see that the blue and orange data are on top of each other and quite separate from the cobalt 2 phosphide reference. So this is a very analytical study that it would have been difficult um, uh, not to mention inconvenient to wait for beam time, but Zane's was exactly what was needed. So um, a lot like XRD, this is comparison to reference standards. And so it doesn't require a lot of expertise to do this kind of study. Um, we've uh, had an ongoing collaboration related to uh, battery electrodes and supercapacitors uh, based on um, a V205. And so here we have these uh, V205 nano rods with um, a, a conducting polymer gradually deposited on the surface reacting somewhat with the V205 with the goal of increasing the conductivity of the V205, which um, otherwise is, uh, is an insulator or at least a significant gap semiconductor. Um, the question though was, okay, how many oxygen defects are being formed, and then are they preferentially on the surface of the V205 or spread throughout the bulk? So um, this is one example of a study. Um, we did uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to understand the oxygen vacancies and occurrence of vanadium 5 plus near the surface of the nanorods, but then also did the zanes to look in the bulk. And you can see in the bulk that the oxygen vacancies uh, turn on much more slowly with the thickness and reactivity of the p-dot, the conducting polymer layer. And um, uh, this, this fed back in a very positive way into the synthesis approaches for this kind of electrode material. And there's four or five publications out um, just based on this measurement. And the key point here was the rapid feedback um, the students in, uh, in uh, Guajong Tsao's group in material science would bring over one batch of samples, learn something, come back two weeks later, measure another batch of samples, and so on. And so these measurements could be done at the synchrotron, technically speaking, but logistically speaking, it would have been very challenging. Um, solution phase, um, you know, concentrated... Uh, um, uh, sorry, I should just say concentrated doesn't necessarily mean solid. Um, so uh, the first recent uh, lab XAS work on solutions uh, was done by the, the Budapest and Krakow collaboration with their very nice von Hamos instruments. I'll refer you to these papers. Um, we've also done um, uh, some solution phase measurement, though it hasn't come to publication yet. We've mostly been interested in battery electrolytes, and I hope to tell you about that someday. But I bring up solution phase here, um, uh, specifically in transition to actinides. So 
um, actinides, um, you know, XFs is a really important part of heavy element chemistry research, but beam time for rad materials is very scarce. Um, uh, here we have lab XAS uh, with a spectrometer at Los Alamos Labs that we, uh, we built for a collaborator there. The agreement with the synchrotron is good. Um, I'll say that the, uh, the first paper showing lab XFs for actinide uh, materials was from Helsinki, Rene Bess, and Sima Hutari and collaborators. And um, they're working to try and put together a lab XAS material specifically, lab XAS facilities specifically for rad materials. And they really deserve credit for showing a great diversity of lab XFs applications. Um, I'll also say that uh, Neil Hyatt's group in Sheffield and Carolyn Pierce and others at PNNL are each studying glasses for long time storage of waste with lab XFs and XCS. Um, two last notes about actinides. Um, separations chemistry is really important for the world, right? It's the thing that's going to clean up a lot of waste and help with um, uh, long term storage of waste. And um, most solvents are transparent, basically transparent at 17 kilovolts. And so I think there's a lot of potential for um, actinide and heavy element wet chemistry uh, XFs to be done in the lab for that reason. Um, uh, last thing here is on August 13th, um, uh, Juan Juan Huang from Technical University of Munich is going to talk about their very recent work using a, an inverse Compton source to do fast extended XFs at high energies. And I hope everyone can, uh, can come to that talk. All right, so, you know, so far we have these new directions for hard X-ray lab XFs. I'm going to talk about XCS next. Industrial quality control, rapid feedback for accelerated materials discovery, um, actinide science, I think is very important. And a key point is many of these really don't fit the typical synchro synchrotron access model. And so the lab XAS is generally not competing with the synchrotron facilities. And I'll stop here for questions again. Okay, thanks. Um, are there, you know, if you have any questions, type them in. I'll ask one to start with. You didn't really talk about much about um, the source stability or using like what would classically be an I0 or a monitor normalization. Um, I assume that you've done those tests and either they're not super, they're, but can you comment on how, what that looks like? In the sure, house? I'm, I'm, hap I'm happy to comment on it. Um, uh, excluding uh, gradual thermal drift, which you have to be careful about, um, the, the modern high voltage supplies are, are really, they're really dead steady. And so um, uh, we find that we can uh, take the sample out and measure an I0 spectrum and then put the sample in and measure IT. Um, you have to be careful about uh, dead time corrections. Uh, you know, if you hit a fluorescence line on the tube, that sometimes gives you a glitch that can be difficult to correct for. But on the whole, this seems to work. Uh, this seems to work really pretty well. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions? I guess I'll ask another one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the quality needed for the crystals, the, you know, the monochromator crystals that you use and, and what, what you find to, for those? Well, we've, we've really been piggybacking um, on the development of the spherical analyzers for the synchrotron. Yeah. Um, uh, I think our energy resolution more often in the Roland circle instruments is limited by the source size. Uh, rather than by the analyzer quality. Um, uh, and, and again, for the different, there, there's several different designs of lab XFs out there. And for each of them, they have to worry about both source size effects and also analyzer quality effects. Okay. Yeah. Well, so there are, there are some questions now from uh, Shikwan Sun. Do you, do you have a question? Go ahead and ask if you're ready. Uh, hi. I'm ju just wondering, is it possible to uh, perform the institute measurement with is exhaust, say, uh, during the charging or discharging uh, cycle? Um, I'm not quite sure I followed all of the question, but this is a, a charging study here for a pouch cell. Was that your question? Oh, yeah. So this is the, the institute measurement. Uh, this was done at University of Washington. Um, uh, I'd really rather not talk about any of the, the commercial systems today, uh, wanting this to be an academic talk. All right, sure. 
Okay, and then uh, Jeff Camilano. Hi, Jeff. I uh, you have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, it's a it's a question, but I but Jerry might not be able to talk about it because um, of what he just said. You know, I I, I think this, there's a lot of potential value in these lab systems, so I'm totally I'm excited about this talk. Um, but I'm not capable of building my own, and so can you say anything about ballpark about what something like this does cost for one of us interested users? Yeah, I really, I really can't. Um, since I'm yeah, a state employee, I, I can't be involved in management of any commercial entity, but okay. I'll refer you to the, the several companies um, uh, yeah. uh, and other people who are, who are building them. Sure. I'll look into it. Okay. Right. right. I'd say it's fair to say that they're available, right? So. Yes, they're available. Okay, and then uh, John Rare has a has a question. Okay, now I'm scared. <laughs> yeah. John. John asks, how, how do scientists know what they are measuring is accurate? Wouldn't it be uh, desirable to couple that with some minimal theory? I think that would be lovely. And um, uh, something I won't have uh, uh, much chance to tell you about today is there is an STTR grant from NSF um, uh, part of which is at University of Washington, where we're trying to better understand how to teach XAPS in the undergrad and, uh, and graduate level. And, um, uh, and I very much sympathize with John's point of view. Okay, and then finally, uh, or for now, uh, Tim Hyde, do you have a question? Um, go ahead and ask. Or, uh... Hi, uh, Jerry. Could you say something about the current energy range of lab XAS uh, instruments in general, and the likelihood of expansion of this range in the future. It's it's um uh, it's a very good question. Um, the um, the limitation for anyone using a Bragg analyzer, which is most but not all of the uh, applications, is that as you go to high energies, the efficiency of the Bragg reflection steadily decreases, so that the Actinide study took several hours just for Zanes, whereas here you can see the, uh, the nickel took three minutes um, uh, for Zanes. Um, in the, oh, I don't know, 1980s, early 1990s, there were some really interesting attempts to use uh, Lowy analyzers instead of Bragg analyzers to get higher efficiency at high energies. Um, in general, though, the lab XF systems are going to work best between roughly five and 12 kilovolts. Going to lower energies can be tricky because of internal absorption in the tube and the need to then put the whole system in an enclosed environment, but it might be possible. Um, higher energies um, uh, would either require, uh, getting really good performance at higher energies, would uh, require one of three things, either going to a Lowy geometry, uh, going to a, energy dis a very high resolution energy dispersive detector, such as the transition edge sensors, it would be a good way to extend higher. And the third possibility, um, and this is Lowy related, is that talk I mentioned coming up on, on August 13th uh, with the inverse Compton source. Um, it's not quite clear if that should be called Lab XAS or not. It's sort of in between Lab XAS and Synchrotron, but it clearly has wonderful performance at high energies. Okay, and I. Uh... Uh, let's let one more. Uh, Jens has a, uh, a comment, I think, on, on energy dispersal system. Yeah, hi, Jerry. But uh, I just want to say that also microcalorimeters, of course, don't have this focus problem and can go in the tender range, uh, sort of lower than the crystals go, and get energy resolution there too. But of course, this is a totally different ballpark in uh, investment. So, but uh, I mean, you all know this too, but it's a. Uh, uh, of course, your system is absolutely fantastic for, for accessibility, but that's not something which uh, microcalorimeters can achieve. Well, not yet. I mean, it's always good to wait for the future. Um, other questions, Matt? I think, that, I think that's it. Why don't, why don't you continue and, and we'll ask the rest of the questions at the end. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'll move to emission spectroscopy now. So um, uh, our first, uh, our fir one of our first real projects with the emission spectroscopy in the lab uh, addresses hexavalent chromium. 
So hexavalent chromium is a, a, a carcinogen for humans. And so there's a number of regulations in the European Union that require, this might be less than 10,000, sorry, I meant to double check it. Uh, let's say less than 1,000 parts per million hexavalent chromium in each component of consumer products. And so that means you need an industry accepted standard test method to actually demonstrate compliance. Um, but this chromium-3, chromium-6 ratio in plastics and other uh, insoluble matrices is challenging. There had been some um, sort of XCS, XRF work um, showing that the, uh, one of the preferred tests out there from the Environmental Protection Agency wasn't very reliable and that there was a lot of species conversion from chromium-6 to chromium-3 on liquid extraction. So um, uh, there's a challenge here that some of the plastics rad damage fairly quickly. And so we thought we would try the K-alpha and also put in a sample spinner and it worked pretty well. Uh, these various labels are different names for different plastics as standard reference materials. Um, uh, all you need to know is they are various plastics with 50 to 1,000 parts per million total chromium content. And we were able to reliably measure uh, in the lab the chromium content by doing a linear superposition analysis of the, what's this, the chromium 3 plus reference CR203 and the chromium 6 plus reference, the, the barium chromium 04. So that worked really well. And it raises a question for the future of whether high resolution lab XES could become uh, part of a standard test method for uh, regulatory compliance for this application, possibly also for leather, possibly also for mining, uh, mine tailings. Um, uh, I really can't mention XES, lab XES, without showing at least a schematic of this instrument. Uh, this is from uh, Wolfgang Malzer's group at um, TU Berlin, and this spectrometer is located at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion in Mülheim. And it, it's really, uh, uh, really the ultimate of if I have a small sample that's air sensitive and rad damage sensitive, um, how do I do the spectroscopy and do it really well? And I hope we can have a talk uh, in the future that discusses some of, uh, uh, some of this instrumentation and the results. Um, moving that being said to tender x-rays, um, this is a, a, a rough rendering of uh, one of the small instruments we built in our lab. It's based on a 10 centimeter rolling circle. It's dispersive. It fits inside a glove box. We're doing that soon. Um, and um, it's insensitive to sample spot size so we can distribute beam damage over a large spot. Uh, this is what raw data looks like. This is process data. It's fast. The count rate is comparable to synchrotron. But let's worry about applications. Um, something we've really been trying hard and we're making some progress on now is how can we use this for sulfur? And specifically for sulfur because there basically is no such thing as sulfur NMR because of the isotopes involved. So here's a measurement down to trace levels, 150 parts per million sulfur in um, oak biochar. Um, uh, sulfur speciation in biochar was believed to be important for um, the viability of biochars as soil amendments. And you can see here we have a simple linear superposition of this is what K-alpha-1,2 looks like for the sulfate and this is what it looks like for the sulfide. And we can get an oxidation state ratio off of that pretty easily. And of course, there had been a, a really important prior work at the synchrotron on sulfur K-alpha that established there is this simple shift, for the most part, simple shift with oxidation state for the sulfur, sulfur and phosphorus K-alpha-1,2. Um, phosphorus, um, we have this paper with Brandy Cosart's group, uh, came out in chem uh, Chemistry of Materials in 2018. The problem here is that the um, quantum dot LEDs in your flat panel display are likely cadmium selenide, which gives a long time waste disposal problem. So there's a very broad effort um, to try and use indium phosphide quantum dots as the basis for the LED instead. So these are indium phosphide uh, uh, little spherical quantum dots, often with a zinc sulfide cladding around it to um, prevent environmental effects and passivate the surface. And the problem is you get phosphate defects at the interface that you want to know how much is there and are they what's making the quantum dots not work well. And the, the second problem is this is buried. 
And so you can't just do XPS to determine the phosphorus oxidation state because the, um, the, uh, uh, the electrons don't get back out through the zinc selenide, pardon me, zinc sulfide without losing energy. So again, prior work um, uh, 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 such as by Matt Jess Kovchak, and he's another guy I probably should have mentioned on that first slide about people with interest uh, and, and accomplishment in lab-based methods, um, showed that phosphorus K-alpha uh, uh, has simple sensitivity to oxidation state. So this is um, an example of that with phosphorus going from nominal oxidation state of minus one to minus three to plus five. It's a nice simple shift. And um, this is uh, uh, one sample of about two milligrams of these quantum dots on a silicon wafer about one hour integration time. And we inferred 49% oxidized, 51% reduced. Uh, this is um, a 31 phosphorus magic angle spinning NMR. And there they had 54% reduced, 46% oxidized. Um, but the measurement took four days with 100 milligrams of sample. And um, so, you know, they agree well. The phosphorus XAS has uh, some analytical advantages, clearly. But the, uh, again, a key point here is this is really being used analytically. This isn't replacing the synchrotron. It's, it's filling the need for immediate measurement for routine analytical characterization during new material synthesis, right? We iterated three or four or five batches of samples um, relatively quickly in the period of, of, of a few months, several months with our collaborators in chemistry. And that's just the kind of thing that it's hard to do at the synchrotron. Um, this paper just came out a few days ago in the Just Accepted at JFIS Chem A. Um, what you're seeing here is a sulfur valence decor XES some measured in our lab, some measured a few decades ago with earlier generation of, of a low energy lab XCS by group in Japan. And I wanted to point out the really excellent agreement between theory and experiment for all of these spectra. So this is NW Chem, which is using linear response TDDFT. And the um, agreement with experiment is good enough that we're going to go ahead and we have launched a project to do a machine learning study to try to understand what actually is the independent information content in valence decor XES, um, basing that off the calculations from NW Chem. In any event, this is a measurement you can do in the lab. So I'll conclude here. There's this hypothesis that says that there's a, a really very wide range of XAPs and XES applications that just aren't happening at all right now and, um, and often don't fit with the synchrotron. And, um, uh, here are the examples we've come up with, industrial quality control, regulatory compliance, rapid feedback for materials discovery, um, anything involving sulfur. Um, uh, the phosphorus oxidation state is easier with, uh, uh, with the XES than it is with NMR. And of course, actinide science um, and separations chemistry, I think, are going to be very important uh, uh, applications of lab XAS as we go forward. So um, I'm open for questions. Okay, thanks, Jerry. So, if anyone has questions, please type them in. I'm going to ask a I'm going to ask a hard one or a or a what about ism kind of question. But so one of the things that's really challenging for us poor synchrotron people is being able to do aluminum silicon because it's hard to get a monochromator that can do aluminum and silicon. Yeah. And, and the fluorescent and the fluorescent yields are low. Mm -hmm. um, what are the prospects for a system like this? being able to do even even at you know ridiculously slow count rates or mm -hmm. you know, being able to do aluminum and silicon speciation? Um, well, I mean, I think there's a, a couple different questions here. So if you mean emission spectroscopy, um, it might be possible to go to a larger despacing crystal in our kind of instruments. It's really clear you could do it with transition ed sensor arrays. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, um, uh, for the XSAPs, um, it, it's tricky because you're kind of at the high end of energy for the laser plasma source. And you're at an energy where the X-ray tubes are often very problematic. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, I mean, it's, it's possible, but you'd have to want to do it very badly. Um, uh, I think the group in Berlin probably has more experience than I do thinking about that energy range. 
So I don't know if um, uh, Brigitte or Wolfgang want to say something about uh, the possibility of aluminum and silicon. Right, I, I would say that I think it's just interesting to try to get speciation or facilities or instruments that can do the speciation, whether that's from reliable XES, high resolution XES, or from XAS, it doesn't matter so much. There's just a, a strong need for those uh, okay. elements to be speciated. Okay, so let's go on with uh, Matthew Marcus has a question. Uh, yeah, I, was wondering about, I was wondering about, uh, you were talking about the uh, actinides at the L edges, and as you mentioned that it's, it's hard to do that because of the high energy. What about the M edges? Yeah, so the M edges, I mean, we've, um, our collaborator at Los Alamos, I believe, has done some, uh, some M edge XES. Um, I don't recall how informative it is, sorry. Um, and for the X apps, I mean, you need an awfully thin sample. And again, there's the problem of uh, uh, the X-ray tubes. Um, you probably need to think about a, <coughs> excuse me, a modified design to the X-ray tube to improve flux at lower energies. There had been some work on that, um, oh, in the 1980s that I think largely petered out that made use of not vacuum tubes, but sort of flowing gas um, uh, uh, for the cathode ray to go through so that it kept impacting on ions and you could have a very high current generating a high flux without uh, getting space charge effects. Well, what about also uh, fluorescence X XAS? I think that um, there, there are um, a few places where it could be possible in the lab, but in general, your incident flux is, uh, is, really, is really pretty limiting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Sergio, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this question. Uh, can you comment on sample environment possibilities, options? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, uh, there's a lot as long as you work to keep the background absorption from your container walls um, as low as possible. Um, so, you know, the, the, the usual 10 micron quartz capillary will be fine at eight or nine kilovolts and above, um, uh, though you have to ask about uh, sample spot size and our beam spot size and so on, whether a capillary makes sense for XAFs, though it works well for XES. Uh, the pouch cell, as long as you're careful in choosing the material for the pouch so that the aluminum and the polymer are on the thin side of the industrial available materials, um, that works reasonably well. Uh, liquid cells, we've gotten just fine uh, extended XAFs on concentrated liquids um, by um, uh, wetting tissue paper and putting it between Kapton tape, just like at the synchrotron. Uh, as an extreme example, right now I've been building a high temperature furnace, uh, XAFS compatible furnace um, to uh, help people at Pacific Northwest National Labs do lab XAFS on molten salts at about a thousand centigrade. So there's a lot of possibility, but it definitely requires more care than at the synchrotron because of space constraints and also because of the limited incident flux uh, means that you really have to worry about background um, uh, background from windows and, and other components of your environment. Okay, uh, Jeff Catalano had another question. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the x-ray emission stuff. Um, for like a typical like first row transition metal, I know there's a range there, but like what do you think some of the practical detection limits might be in terms of the like PPM content so I, the chromium study you showed, I thought there was maybe an attempt to limit exposure time because of beam damage. I'm just trying to get a ballpark, like what could we do? It's a good, it's a really, it's a really good question. There's two aspects to it. One is um, at what concentration could you do speciation if the speciation was significant in its ratio? And so that's what we showed in the chromium study. And that was even just done with the 10 watt tube that was done in the coffin um, uh, is, you know, even to low concentrations of the metal. Um, if the background's not too absorbing, again, mostly low Z, except for the PVC, the chlorine and the PVC. Um, uh, you, you can do an awful lot in terms of getting the ratio of oxidation states when there actually is a signature. Um, 
a, a different spin on your question would be what if I had something concentrated and I wanted to know, um, you know, is there some small fraction of an undesirable species, such as uh, could you detect chromium-6 in makeup is something we've been playing around with a little bit lately. And that's, uh, it's funny, in some ways that's more challenging than the dilute study um, because the shifts in the XCS tend to be relatively small. Um, I, we usually quote our, our combined statistical and systematic errors at you know, two or three percent for our ability to get a ratio of oxidation states. So um, uh, I, hope that, uh, I hope that helps. That was great. Thank you. I'll also say that not all transition metals in uh, all systems um, have a simple shift of the K-alpha with oxidation state. It can be quite complicated and, um, for, uh, say, iron oxides is a notorious, uh, a notorious bad actor in that way. Okay, so uh, thanks. For, that's awesome. Uh, Tim, hi, did you have a question for Jerry? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you've sort of half answered my question already talking about sample environments, but I'll sort of put it in a slightly different way um, in as much as clearly a lot of in situ that, that we would ordinarily do at the synchrotron is based on high photon flux. So is there developments within lab XES instruments that will that high water tubes or whatever it might be give give these higher photon fluxes or are, are we only ever really going to have to look at what, what I call slow in situ measurements in general using lab lab based instruments going going forward just due to the lack of photon flux it's it, it's a really good question um, uh, So if I had as much money as I wanted, um, uh, I could imagine getting something like a 20 kilowatt rotating anode and throwing a bank of a couple half meter optics on it and getting something that was, that was getting up to um, six, seven, oh, somewhere in the 10 to the eights. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what kind of spot size I could keep. And, and again, there's a number of different technologies out there. Um, you know, there, there would be, there's, there's some room forward. Uh, two comments I'll give is remember that emission spectroscopy is already there in terms of having the count rate you'd want for just about any study um, if you made a um, special environment that could get close enough to the x-ray tube. And the second comment, and this kind of ties into the inverse Compton source uh, that I mentioned earlier, is, you know, that, of course, is a whole different intermediary between the lab XAS and the synchrotron. And uh, up at uh, Silver K edge, was that 28 kilovolts? Uh, they're getting extended XAFs in a couple of minutes. And so if you think about uh, your 5D transition metals uh, in catalysis and wanting to do at least relatively fast in situ studies of them, you know, there is an alternative to the synchrotron. Um, it's pricey. Um, but, um, uh, uh, but, it, but it is out there and maybe that's another future direction for the catalysis community, uh, at least for the heavier elements, to think about a facility based on that kind of technology. Sure, thanks. I mean, I think we just need to be creative and find new experiments to do to some extent. <laughs> um, sure, okay. Thanks. So, so fi maybe finally, um, uh, Jen's had a question that I, has anyone used a, a, a liquid metal jet as the source for lab XS? Well, the liquid metal jet is used as the source for the lab XES in the instrument in Mülheim. Um, I don't know. Uh, if so, I at least don't remember it right now, and I, and I apologize if I'm uh, 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 forgetting it and not giving someone credit where, uh, where it's due, but uh, I, don't, I don't know of one. Um, yeah. If I understand correctly, that would have a, a smaller spot size. Is that correct? Yeah, so, and, and that similar. also allows you to do focusing and uh, and a lot of other things. Yes. 